Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Thank you for helping us reach 70,000 subscribers. Today's episode takes us to the frozen north of the Yukon Territory in Canada, near a small town called Mayo. It lies about 250 miles north of Whitehorse and is surrounded by wilderness and is the home range of the native tribe known as the Big River People. This area has a subarctic climate and temperatures range from minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit in winter, which lasts about six months, to 97 degrees in the summer, with extremely short spring and fall seasons. This area receives about 12 inches of precipitation per year, but most of that falls in the winter season as snow. With some of the nation's highest mountains here, in the St. Elias mountain range, the peaks stay covered in snow year-round. In the northern part of the territory, boreal forests give way to tundra. Black spruce, white spruce, quaking aspens, and balsam poplar provide a sheltering canopy for caribou, moose, mule deer, and elk to hide in. The predators of this area are plentiful and include wolves, black, brown, and polar bears, as well as cougars. It is in this setting that our story begins today. Valerie Theoret and her companion, Yermand Rochalt, had just ten months prior welcomed their first child, Adele, into the world. Theoret was originally from Quebec and moved here about ten years ago. She made fast friends and immersed herself in the Francophone community in the area. Valerie was nearing the end of her maternity leave from her sixth grade teaching position guiding children in French immersion at Whitehorse Elementary School in Whitehorse, Yukon. Germain was a 37-year-old owner-operator of a company called Wild Tracks, which guided hunting, fishing, and trapping expeditions. He was from Norway originally, but blended in in the territory and its rigorous wilderness folk. The family had purchased one of the 360 trap lines in the territory about three years ago, and it was located near Einerson Lake. Here, he harvested wolves, foxes, lynx, and other fur bearers, and she would design and sell trinkets from their fur. They would take their wares back to town and sell them at trade shows and events. While visiting the cabin, the family would live off the land and enjoy their remote haven together. Their friends indicated that they were well aware of the dangerous animal life in the area and were very experienced outdoors people. Running a trap line is a labor-intensive and perilous pursuit. Germond would frequently have to leave Valerie and their daughter at the cabin while he ventured on foot or snowmobile along their trap line to harvest animals caught in them, then reset the traps to continue to catch more. This way of life was so important to them that they'd been discussing doing it full-time and year-round. Their friends described them as having the time of their lives doing what they loved to do together. Given their experience, they knew they had to keep things clean around their cabin. They didn't leave food scraps or waste around to attract unwanted visitors. However, in their shed, they stored organs and entrails from animals to use in their trap lines as bait. They never had a problem with animals invading it, though, as it would be used up as winter passed. On the morning of November 26, the family ate breakfast together and enjoyed each other's company. Germán rounded up his trap line equipment and loaded it onto his snowmobile. The couple chatted as he got ready to do his trap line check for the day, and once he was ready, Germán headed out with his snowmobile leaving a distinct trail for him to follow to get back home. Somewhere between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., Tiorette decided to take Adele for a walk and enjoy the scenery and solitude together. She bundled the baby up, as well as herself, and placed the baby into the backpack carrier for the trip. The ladies walked along the snowmobile tracks away from the cabin. They were approaching a low-growing spruce tree when they saw something move underneath its dense boughs. While Germund was traveling the several-mile-long trapline route, a large grizzly bear was searching for food. Normally this time of year, bears are hibernating, but this one has had a tough year and didn't pack on enough fat during the summer to make it through hibernation. He's emaciated, and is wasted away to just over 300 pounds, but his ideal weight would have been around 600 pounds this time of year. As the bear searched the empty forest for food, its prospects were bleak. It wandered near the lake to an outfitter's camp, then in the general direction of the cabin, about 1.2 kilometers away. 
It eventually came across Yermon's snowmobile tracks and followed them for a considerable distance, then wandered off them again toward the creek. For some reason, the bear was drawn back to the snowmobile tracks and a direct path toward the cabin. The bear tracks left in the snow showed a transition in pace. They initially were careless and meandering as the bear dragged its feet with a shuffling gait. It then transitioned into a much more carefully placed gait as if it was sneaking up on something. The bear was no longer shuffling its feet through the snow, rather, it was picking its paws up and carefully placing them. As the bear approached Stiaret and Adele, it must have seen them before they saw it. Its tracks dashed off the side of the path, about two meters, and discreetly underneath the spruce tree. At around 2.30 p.m., Gervon was on his way back toward the cabin when he noticed a foreboding sign in his snowmobile tracks from the morning. He slowed his snowmobile down and carefully observed the tracks of a large brown bear. As he followed the trail, the tracks continued and then veered off, only to return a few hundred meters down the trail. He was far from the cabin and his family at this point, and his concern began to grow into fear. When Yermon arrived, he jumped off his snowmobile and quickly walked toward the cabin, with his 7mm Magnum Remington rifle in his hand. He opened the door and glanced around the small interior. The ladies were not there. He decided to go check to see if they were in the sauna adjacent to the cabin. The ladies were not there either. Something seemed amiss about this situation. He decided to follow their tracks in the snow as they left the cabin along his snowmobile trail. About 240 meters from the cabin, Yermon's head snapped up. A deep growl rumbled from the spruce trees in front of him. Suddenly a gaunt but large framed bear exploded from the brush. Hermann raised his rifle to his shoulder and fired, but the bear continued to bound toward him. He fired two more times in quick succession, and still the bear continued to advance the distance. He fired one more time, and the bear piled up on the ground, dead, just two meters from him. After collecting himself, Hermann began to examine the bear. As he approached it, he noticed Tiorette. He had found Tiorette's body. The bear had fallen very near her corpse. His mind turned to Adele. He began walking around, trying to find a clue as to where she was. He found her remains a short distance away. Both his mate and his child were killed by the bear. Yermon bottled his emotions and retrieved a tarp from the cabin. He carefully placed the tarp over the ladies' bodies and activated an emergency beacon to notify the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The authorities arrived the next morning and gathered evidence of the incident and examined the bear's remains. The analysis of the bear's remains revealed it to be an 18-year-old male. It was in terrible shape, emaciated, and had a large wound in its gut. It had almost no detectable body fat. The wound in its gut had partially healed and was more serious at a prior point. The wound was believed to have happened only a few weeks before the attack. The authorities were uncertain what would cause the bear to be in such poor condition, as it was in the prime years of its life. The necropsy of the bear also revealed that it had begun eating items not normally in its diet. They found the quills of a porcupine embedded in its digestive tract. After compiling all of the information from the bear tracks and the attack, authorities believed the bear ambushed the ladies from a very close proximity, which gave them no chance to escape. They noted the danger of bears, even when they should be hibernating. Valerie's friend described her as a ray of sunshine in the community. They commented on how Adele was a miniature copy of her right down to her habit of smiling all the time. Her friends lamented their absence, noting she had touched a lot of people. Chief Conservation Officer Gordon Hitchcock stated that the bear attack on Tiret and Adele was a tragic chance occurrence. He indicated that humans don't fit the prey profile for bears, and that they don't seek humans as prey. He finished by stating that predatory bear attacks on humans are very rare. The hibernation period for brown bears usually lasts from November through late spring. There have been three fatal brown bear attacks in Yukon Territory since 1996. Brown bears are estimated to be between six and 7,000 in population, while black bear populations are estimated to be 10,000, and polar bear populations are estimated to be 1,500 in the territory. Each year, an average of 76 grizzly bears are harvested and just under 200 black bears from the Yukon Territory. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. 
Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop for Christmas presents. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.